gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Smucker, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Director. Good morning. As a previous small business owner, I uh, understand the need to uh, balance the budget each year. We had to match expenses to revenue, or you threaten the future of the company. And of course, as families, we do that on an annual basis as well. Um, so I've talked about the federal budget in those terms. You know, we expect families, businesses to do that. Uh, why can't we do that at the federal level? In the states, we've had a, a tool. We have a balanced budget amendment in Pennsylvania, served in the state Senate there. That required us to uh, um, it, it impose discipline on the process, if I will. But I brought this up uh, at a, spoke at a Rotary recently, and first question from its constituent said that the federal government's different. We cannot compare the two. We can't compare federal government to businesses. Um, because uh, at federal government, we can print money, so it's not the same thing. Um, that's, by the way, very different than we had a hearing in this very room. CBO Director Hall was here, and he used a term called sovereign debt crisis. Uh, if we don't change the trajectory of our, of our annual deficits, the growth in those deficits. So I'm curious, uh, what, what is your thought on that? What happens? if we continue down the path that we're on right now. Well, let me speak to the, the, the point you, you, that someone raised to you at the Rotary meeting, which is technically I suppose they're right. You could simply print money, but what does that mean? What does that mean in the real world? It's not free to do that. If it were, we'd do it every single day, right? When we print money to pay off debt, when we print money to, to pay for things, what it essentially does is make the existing dollars in your pocket worth less. That's why they call inflation one of the cruelest taxes, especially on the older uh, generations that have saved for retirement now living off of their investments and so forth. So when you print money, um, you do nothing but essentially tax the people who are already there. It's a tax in a different form. So you can go back to your folks at Rotary and say, look, I guess you're probably right. Why don't you give me, say, 20 percent of the money in your pocket and we'll call it even? Um, because that's what it would take to effectively uh, balance the budget. Actually, I think the number this year is going to be about 14 um, percent. But w where are we headed? We're headed to where I talked about is uh, we will balance the budget eventually one way or the other, on our terms or on somebody else's, um, either by balancing the budget the proper way, printing a bunch of money that impoverishes our citizens, or having somebody else who won't lend us money force certain considerations on us in order to get us to balance as a condition to lending us money. Only one of those outcomes is desirable, Congressman, and that is the one about figuring out a way to do it ourselves before it's too late. Which requires tough decisions. But uh, I want to also, as a business owner, I saw the real impact. We talk about 3 percent, 2 percent, 1 percent growth. And when you're just talking figures, it doesn't seem like a lot. But I've, you know, we had about 150 employees in our business. And I've been through times of recession, times of low economic growth, and the jobs just weren't available. We were a construction company. And so, you know, small enough company, we knew the employees, we knew the families, and saw the impact when we had to, we had to tell people we just simply don't have enough work and had to lay people off. And, you know, I'm, one of the reasons that I think we're all here is to provide opportunity for our kids, our grandkids, to help lift people out of poverty, provide that economic mobility. Uh, and I think the best possible thing that we can do is have a higher economic growth that will provide that opportunity. I'd just like to hear your response to that. Um, I'm interested to hear the story about your family. My family was in the home building business. And one of the things, my, my dad has turned 75 this year, and one of the things I think he's most proud of is the number of folks who are making more than $100,000 at his company, this is 20 years ago now, that didn't have a, didn't have a, a college degree. In fact, many of them didn't have a high school degree. Uh, because you could make that kind of living in a healthy American economy in the construction business. And I think that uh, growth cures so many ills. Okay. Bill Clinton gave more people, gave being the wrong verb, but provided health insurance for more people than Hillary Care would have simply by having economic growth. It solves so many of our problems. In fact, would probably cure a lot between the two parties because it's a lot more fun to govern in a growing economy than it is in a sluggish one. I think one. there's a lot we can agree on here in both parties. But I do want to mention one other aspect of the budget, and this was brought up. Our nation faces a growing heroin opioid, opioid epidemic that is shattering the lives of families in my district and devastating communities across the nation. Uh, this public health crisis claimed the lives of more than 3,383 Pennsylvanians and 33,000 Americans in 2015 alone, uh, and it's getting worse. I sent you a letter last week, which I'd like to submit to the record, Madam Chair, if I could. 
Without objection. Um, and I again laud you for recognizing the severity of this crisis and for prioritizing life-saving investments into the office of the National Drug Policy. I wonder if you could explain to the members of this committee just exactly how the President's budget uh, request increases the federal government's response to the opioid crisis. I, I can, Congressman. I see that my time has expired, but I'd be more than happy to both talk to you about that and, 